I want to give you a different perspective because losing weight around the belly isn't about efforting. It's about understanding why your body accumulated weight there in the first place. So first, I hope you all know, if you're new to my channel, you probably don't know, but I hope many of you are waking up to the fact that calories in, calories out is not your strategy for losing weight. If it was, we would not be in the obesity problem that we have today. So what happens when we lower our calories down and we increase our exercise and we use that as a weight loss tool is we redo or we reset our set point. Set point is what that moment that your body is either going to gain weight or lose weight. So let me give you an example. If you only eat two, let's say you eat 2000 calories and you exercise an output of 500 calories, giving you a net of 1500 calories, and that's working for you, you're gonna always have to stay at that 1500 calorie mark to stay the same weight. If you wanna lose weight, you're gonna have to get under that 1500 calorie mark, go to more like 1000 calories to be able to drop weight. And then if you do that, you start lowering your set point. Now your set point's a thousand calories. This is why we've, we have an obesity problem is everybody's counting calories. Everybody's trying to exercise their way out of their, their weight gain. And it is not the tool in order to lose weight. You want to be smarter than that. You want to tap into easier systems than that. So I'm not saying go eat a ton of calories. I'm not saying sit on your bum and don't exercise. I'm just saying be cautious about the way that your brain might be approaching weight loss from this calorie in, calorie out standpoint, because long term, that is not successful. Okay. Number two reason why diet and exercise doesn't work for losing belly fat is it's not allowing you to dip into your fat burning energy system. So remember, I've taught you all here on this channel that what we want to do is metabolically switch. I spoke of it in Fast Like a Girl. I have a whole chapter on it. So when you are metabolically switching, you are becoming a very good sugar burner. And then when your blood sugar comes down, you're switching over into your fat burning energy system. And you're starting to burn fat for fuel, which is giving you those ketones. So if we never come over here to this fat burning system, then what happens is you're never permanently burning fat. You're just working from the sugar burner system. So let's use what the classic thing somebody does when they go to lose weight is they restrict what they eat and then they exercise a bunch. All of that is just using, trying to manipulate the sugar burner system. The only way you get over the fat burning system is through fasting. This is why I'm such a fan of fasting is I want you to practice taking what those good habits that you have around food, those amazing habits you have around exercise. And I just want you to pair it to a fasting length. And in Fast Like a Girl, I wrote six different lengths. So it's anywhere from 12 hours to 72 hours. That's where you start to see more fat being burned permanently. So diet and exercise won't work alone, but if you pair them with a fasting window, they're going to work a lot better because they tap into this fat burning system. Okay, number three, and this is a huge one. And, and what's interesting to me is that we've been really watching your guys' feedback on Fast Like a Girl. And um, actually Amazon gives us some really interesting data on what people are highlighting in Fast Like a Girl for the people who bought the ebook. And one of the most common highlights in there are obesogens. So what happens when we diet and exercise to lose belly fat is we get caught in the low, low carb, but the diet Cokes, the, the gimmicky fake diet foods that are packed with chemicals. And those chemicals will make you gain weight. They are not your door out of, of weight gain. They're actually your door in to weight gain. So obesogens are everything from parabens that you can find actually in like your sunscreens and some of your lotions and your hair, hair products, um, your makeup. So please scan your beauty products. Pesticides, pesticides are on anything that's non-organic. So please try to, to, to buy more organic foods whenever possible. Phthalates, phthalates are found in commercial meats. 
They're also found in fragrances. So any of your beauty products that have fragrances in them or perfumes that you wear, we just don't think of those as, as causing us to gain weight, but they will have a negative impact on blocking receptor sites that will lead to more insulin resistance. Um, so those are really important chemicals that you look at. An easy thing to do, you can look at for it in Fast Like a Girl, or you can go just Google obesogens and look at the list, but then look at your toxic environment. Look at the beauty pro uh, products you're using. Look at the cleaning products you're looking. So obesogens are a real thing, and they're everywhere, and they're causing you to hold on to weight. So please start to unload your, your toxic uh, loads and, and bring them down so that you can, you can really live in the body that you want to live in. Okay, number four reason why diet and exercise doesn't work for belly fat is that it doesn't really address the cortisol issue. Now, gentle forward movement I, uh, exercise like walking, a gentle run, uh, uh, you know, just movement, a yoga, those are cortisol regulating activities. But I'm talking about when you decide, hey, today's the day I'm gonna lose weight, so I'm gonna slap on some gym shoes and I'm just gonna go run as hard as I can, um, and you really push yourself. What we know is that if you're chronically doing that over and over and over again, you're raising cortisol. And belly fat in particular is where cort extra cortisol gets stored in. So I'll just use myself as an example. I know that when I start to feel like, huh, put on my pants a little tight around my waist, and I know I've been fasting, I know I've been eating well, but there's something that there's a little extra padding around my belly, I go immediately to, what have my stress levels been? Because when stress is high, cortisol's high, when cortisol's high, you become more insulin resistant, and your body stores glucose and cortisol in, body, in, in belly fat. So you want some exercise variation where you're doing yoga, you're walking, you can still have your, t your, your push days, but I wanna make sure that you're balancing that with some recovery and some lower cortisol activities. Okay, now number five, the number five reason why diet and exercise alone doesn't work is because you need your liver to burn fat. So diet and exercise, unless you're gonna go into more of the bitter foods, which a lot of you here are doing because I've taught you on video how to do that, but we really want to see that you're leaning into some of those radicchio, arugula, the greens that support healthy liver production, ginger, uh, lemons, those bitter type foods really support your liver and your liver is this key fat burning organ. So we've got to love on the liver and diet and exercise doesn't always do that. This also means things like alcohol. Um, there are a lot of clean alcohols you can do, but if you're really trying to lose weight, get off alcohol of any kind and make sure that you are supporting good liver health because you need your liver to be able to burn fat. So there you go. There are my five things. I hope that's, that's incredibly clear. If you've tried any of these five, please let me know what's worked for you for belly fat. We are a community here. Again, we don't want to change your set point. We want to dip you into the fat burning system. We want to make sure that you're bringing your obesogens down. I want to bring your cortisol down and I want to love on your liver. If you're doing that and your diet and exercising, fine. That's great. But what happens right now, like I've said, is most people turn to diet and exercise without looking at those five things. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I have one major superpower in this world and it literally is making salads. And I ask any of my friends, in fact, any of my friends listening to this right now, put in the comments. If, if, if all my friends are like, oh, you're coming from din for dinner? Let's make a salad. So, and when I make a salad, I, yeah, I think about taste, but I think about health as well. So on this video, I'm gonna show you how to make a salad that heals your body and what do we all want to get rid of? Belly fat. So I want to show you how you put together a salad that helps you burn belly fat and keeps you healthy. Deal? And those of you that are like, well, I don't really like salads. You probably, A, if you clicked on this video, you probably have some inkling that you would make a salad. Um, but I think you'll find that many of the things I'm going to show you here are, 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 are tasty as well, which is great. Okay, so here we go. Let's dive in. First, there are three main ingredients I want you to think about. First is antioxidants. So remember that antioxidants are packed, and I'll go through the ones I like, are packed in foods that when we eat them, 
the antioxidants are like, think of them as like armor for your cells against all the free radicals. Now I want to explain, I, th I feel like antioxidants is like one of those words that just gets like thrown around a lot. Like everybody's like, yeah, antioxidant. Yeah, I should know what an, I should be eating antioxidants. But then we don't really know what an antioxidant is. So when we are living in a day-to-day -day mod, the modern world that we're in right now, What's happening is we're exposed to a lot of chemicals. We're breathing them in, we're eating them, we're touching them, they're everywhere. And those chemicals are going into our cell and they're damaging DNA. And when we look at things like cancer, when we look at chronic diseases, when we look at dementia and Alzheimer's, we look at the struggles that women have with menopause, so much of that is this damaged cellular inner parts of the cell, the working parts of the cell, but specifically the DNA. So the name of the game is to minimize toxins. But we live in a world where toxins are everywhere. Well, hopefully you all know we are living in the most toxic time in human history. So we need to not only just avoid toxins, but we need to add in more antioxidants. And what the antioxidants do is they're like a protector. I should actually make them like, like this. They, they are protecting the cell. So all of a sudden, you know, you walk through the um, department store in the makeup center where like all the phthalates with all those fake fra fragrances, you breathe them in and your cells are like, ah, I'm dying. Like the toxins are destroying the inner parts. And they do do that, by the way, if you don't believe me, do some research on phthalates and beauty products. And if those, if your cells and your body is packed with antioxidants, they're blocking out all those phthalates. They're blocking out all those toxins and they're not letting them into the cell to damage them. So the moral of that story is eat a salad before you go buy some makeup. What we want to do is bring these antioxidants in as many different ways as we possibly can. And here's how you know something's an antioxidant. It is a bright colored fruit or vegetable. So the brighter the color, the better. And, and I've talked about this before. I don't know if I've talked about it recently, but I really like looking at eating the rainbow. I think it's such a great, simple idea, but let's bring in like when I, like one of the things I love so much is peppers. And I eat, I don't eat green peppers. I don't like those so much, but I eat the orange, I eat the yellow, I eat the red. Um, but I don't just, red are my favorite, but I don't eat the red all the time. I wanna make sure I'm getting the other colors. Same thing with things like cabbage. So there's purple cabbage, there's green cabbage. Like, can we start to think of antioxidants and protecting ourselves from these toxins by just something as simple as I am going to open up the colors of the rainbow in my food and put them in my salad. So here are some of the things that I like to put in. Red cabbage, raw red cabbage is one, purple cabbage. For those of you that have young kids, I wanna tell you a trick my mom did, and I really, really like this. Um, she would take purple cabbage and she would cut it up and put some sea salt on it. And whenever we were sitting, whether we were reading or watching TV, um, that cabbage would be our snack. And I, we loved it. We would, it's crunchy, it's kind of like a chip, um, and it has all these antioxidants in it. So uh, cabbage is amazing. And hopefully you know that when we ferment cabbage, we make sauerkraut, which is also amazing. And a lot of times in my salads, I will actually take sauerkraut and I'll just dump it into the salad. And, and it's not as sour because it gets dispersed throughout the salad. I do that when, with, when my kids are around too. And they've learned to kind of like that sour taste. So red cabbage. Second one is berries. Okay, this is a good one. Um, I put fruit in my salad all the time. I actually like when I'm making a salad, I like the juxtaposition of something salty and something sweet. I like something crunchy and something soft. It's a really fun way to make a salad. Salad should be fun. So berries, strawberries. I'm, I'm not a huge strawberry fan, but maybe you are. Strawberries, blackberries, blueberries. A lot of times I'll put like a uh, raspberries. I'll put like a blackberry is one of my favorite and I'll put it in there with like a feta cheese. And it's something about the juxtaposition of those two together in my mouth is like, is, is like heaven. So let's add some berries to the salad. The other one, a great antioxidant is spinach. 
So when I look at greens in my salad, I don't just look at one green. Like I don't just go to the store and get like, oh, mixed greens. I get arugula, I get microgreens. We have found the other day at our local farmer's market, microgreens for basil. Oh my gosh, that was so good. I put basil in, I put mint in, I put collard greens in. I bring in as many, I put chard in. I put as, I cut them all up and put them in as many of them that I possibly can in my salad. So spinach is one, you could do that. Beets are great. Golden beets, red beets, now we're, the beet's not the same, right? It's gonna have different antioxidants. One's gold, one's, one's red. So it's gonna have a different an antioxidant profile. So let's get some beets in there. It's nice, I, I like, you know what is one of my favorite, actually local restaurant got me addicted to this, is an arugula salad with red beets and grapefruit. Okay, now I've got three different levels of antioxidants that I'm filling my, my body with, protecting me from the toxins, and it tastes really good. And then the last one you could put in would be kale. Um, you know, if you don't have like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you do okay with kale, it doesn't make you bloated, let's put some kale in as well. Okay, so that all falls under the category of antioxidants. And there's, I'm just giving you some examples, there's a lot more. Okay, the second thing that you wanna think about when you're putting together a salad that you wanna use to help you lose weight and belly fat and keep your health up is fiber. So the more fibery a food, the healthier it is. Fiber does two things. Fiber feeds our microbiome. So you remember you have these bacteria in your gut that are making you serotonin and they're regulating your blood sugar and they're improving your immune system. So you have all this fiber in there that, that you're feeding these bacteria to make them happy. And we know fiber stabilizes blood sugar, which is amazing. It's really, so, so you're not getting that. Those of you that follow my metabolic switching, you, when you put fiber in food, you're not getting that high blood sugar spike, which means when you fast, you're gonna get over there quicker. You're gonna get to those healing results quicker. So we love fiber. Um, now, an interesting thing, I, I pointed this out in another video, and I just wanna point it out again. A 2001 study, fairly old, found that overweight people that ate 18% less food and lost significantly more weight when they switched to a high fiber diet. So fiber, it, there's so many reasons you wanna eat fiber. Okay, check this out. I have a free fasting guide for you all. It's free and it's gonna teach you all the basics of fasting. It's gonna teach you how to kill hunger when you fast, which is really cool. And it's gonna show you how to break your fast among many other things. All you gotta do is click on this link right here and enjoy. And what's, what I find is really interesting, and I hear this from you, and I've, I've had this own, my own struggles with this, is when we're building a fasting lifestyle, our eating window is smaller. So we need to like lean in and try to find things that will help um, that really maximize our health and a a really big salad I make almost every day using a variety of foods, thinking about antioxidants, thinking about fiber, and how many things can I get in there, kind of like a smoothie. A lot of you use this with a smoothie where you're like, let me pour everything in here in a smoothie that I can and I'll drink it all. I do that with a salad. So some of the fibery foods that work really well in salads, and some of them are gonna surprise you. The two are, are legumes, chickpeas and lentils. So you've got high in protein, high in fiber, Tasty, lentils are really tasty. Lentils are great for hormones too, by the way. Quinoa, quinoa is super high in protein. You can make a quinoa salad, you can pour quinoa into your lettuce salad, that one's really good. We're back at the kale and the cabbage, so you gotta double dipping. You're not only getting the antioxidant, but you're getting the fiber. Avocado, like my favorite food. I think every video, I pretty much talk about avocado. I'm definitely in love with avocado. So it's so good. I When I make a, a salad, I often, we have avocados out in a bowl on our, on our countertop in our kitchen. It's like the last thing, I'll make it, I'll put it all together, and then I go, oh, do we have an avocado? Because I know that the avocado, if I can add as much of the avocado as possible to the salad, that I actually know it will, it will fill me up better. Whereas if it's just that, without some fat in there, I might be hungry an hour or two later. Okay, last macronutrient that you wanna put into your salad. And this one is the most filling, and it's protein. We already talked about protein, right? Talked about it on a lot of videos. I am such a fan of protein, whether you're plant-based or you are um, animal-based. Protein is the, is the breaks on hunger. It helps you build muscle and you need to be getting lots of it. So when you make a salad, can you put protein in it? The other thing about protein is that not only does it help you build muscle so you have more insulin receptors, so you're more insulin sensitive, but it helps in repairing joints. It is 
it's got collagen in it. It keeps your skin and your hair looking at its best. So I can't say enough about protein. I just let's just protein. Let's make sure we're doing more protein. So some of my favorite and some really unique ones, free range chicken for sure. And when I go out to eat, I'm always thinking free range chicken in my salad, grass fed steak. A lot of times, surely you've thought about this, but a lot of times, whatever we ate that night, that protein becomes the source of protein for my lunch salad at lunch. So, and a lot of times that is grass fed steak. We've got wild caught salmon. So wild caught, not farm fresh, skipjack tuna, go watch the video. Video that I did on my no carb snacks. Skip Jack Tuna's in there. Um, sardines. I was just recently in Norway and um, I was staying in a home where they had left me some keto yummy keto treats and sardines was one. I decided to dive in and try it. Sardines are pretty good if you get a high quality sardine. Um, and then of course eggs. Eggs are great in a salad. Just hard boil an egg and put it in a salad is unbelievable. So use the salad, look at it like you look at a smoothie. Like you're putting all these antioxidants, fiber, and protein. Every salad, but think, antioxidants, fiber, protein. And that is what can be this healing treat that tastes so incredibly good. So here's what I need from you, cause I'm, I love salads. So I wanna learn from you. What do you put in a salad? What did I miss? Put in the, in the comments what you put in a salad. If you have a salad recipe, I'd love to see it. Um, and let's all get healthy together and more salads, please. That's the key to longevity, ending chronic disease and living in a body you love. Hope that helped. Dr. Mindy here, and on this video, I'm gonna show you some fasting strategies and some food strategies to go after belly fat. So if you are new to my channel, I just wanna say welcome. Here we go, belly fat. There's two pieces to it. There is the subcutaneous fat that's over the top of the muscles, and there's the visceral fat that's underneath the muscle. Going and doing a bazillion abs is never going to make these two layers of fat go away. If anything, it's oftentimes makes you actually, your abdomen stick out even more. So you gotta have strategies to go after these two types of fat. And believe it or not, subcutaneous fat and visceral fat require two different ways to go after. And I'm gonna actually give you nine different ways to go after these two, these two types of fat. So the first thing that you've got to realize is that all fat is, is excess sugar, it's excess hormones, and it's excess toxins. Your brilliant body found a place to store it to save your life. If it didn't store it as fat, then it would have stored it on organs. And if it stores it on organs, you would die much quicker. So what your body did is it took this excess and it put it on the back of your arms, it put it on your glutes, it put it on your belly, put it on your legs, put it in these places that you are looking at and you're not excited about it. So let's start to unwind this. So there are three steps that I recommend that you do. And within each step is three things. And I would do it in this order. So I wanted to give you some things and a checklist that you can do to go after this abdominal fat. So first step, you've got to increase your fiber. Here's why. When you are eating carbohydrates like cracker, it has very limited fiber in it, so it's going to spike your blood sugar really high. And that extra blood sugar is going to be stored as fat much easier. Whereas if you have a carrot with a lot of fiber in it, that blood sugar spike won't happen as quickly and it may not even go as high. And so if it doesn't go as high, you're not making as much insulin. Insulin gets stored a lot as belly fat. So if you want to not store belly fat, we need to keep insulin down and we, need, we can keep insulin down by eating more fibrous foods. Second thing in this first step, you've got to look at your fat, con what type of fat you're eating. The inflammatory fats, canola, cottonseed, corn, uh, safflower, sunflower, partially hydrogenated, the soybean, these inflammatory fats are toxins. I know they're allowed in food, but they're toxins. And toxins, where do toxins go? The first place that toxins will be stored at as is visceral fat. 
And so those toxins are going to all get stored in the fat underneath the muscle. So let's eat more fiber. Let's change out our fat so that we're not eating inflammatory fats. And let's start to fast because we know even intermittent fasting, if we compress our eating window, we can keep insulin low. If you keep insulin low, we won't end up with as much abdominal fat. Okay, so that's step one. If you haven't done those three things, there's your work, start there. Step two, once you've got a good routine around these three, you're gonna move into lowering your carbohydrates down. So the easiest thing to do with carbs is just swap out the breads and the cakes and the cookies and the pastas and swap that out for nature's carbs. The fruits, the potatoes, the beans. And then if you even wanna go lower carb, you can start to get, you know, get the potatoes out, get the beans out, eat berries and green apples, don't eat the high sugar fruits. And you'll start to bring that blood sugar down, making it so that you require less insulin. Less insulin means less belly fat. So let's lower our carb down. Now, second thing, let's increase our protein. Here's why that's important. Because protein is what builds muscle. And if I took two versions of me here, I put one that has 50% of my body's muscle and this version of me has 80% muscle. If I, the version of me that has more muscle will be burning fat 24 hours a day more efficiently than the version of me that doesn't have muscle. Muscle helps you burn fat and specifically this subcutaneous fat on the outside of your abdomen, the, what, what we all are shooting for, or maybe not, what a lot of people are shooting for in that six packs abs. So you've got to have protein so you can burn this muscle so that you can even see those six pack abs. So increase your protein. Okay, third thing in this step two is you're gonna avoid the obesogens. Go Google this. There is a class of toxins out there called obesogens. I'm gonna tell you one that you're probably ingesting every single day, and that is plastics. So plastics, they cause insulin resistance, and guess where obesogens get stored? Obesogens get stored as both visceral and sub subcutaneous fat. So very common, phthalates are another one, uh, uh, pesticides sprayed on your food is another one. These chemicals are being stored a lot as belly fat. So go Google obesogens, get off those obesogens. Okay, now we've got six things. I haven't even gotten into the last three things. So let me know. I mean, if you're not doing these six and you're upset about belly fat, here's six that you can do. Okay, last three. Cardio, where does cardio fit in? Well, this is really interesting because cardio, what cardio will do is help you use cortisol. And cortisol also gets stored as fat. If you don't use cortisol, it will go on this subcutaneous area of fat. So there, here's how that plays out. You're at work and you, your boss comes in and gives you a, a ton of, of extra work to do. You're stressed out. And now you go and sit at your desk and all of a sudden you got cortisol surging through you. That cortisol is going to go immediately to fat. Cortisol is meant to make you move. So a really good trick is when stress goes up, you move. Go for a walk, get out, walk around your building. Just don't sit. But a lot of us never learned this. So that cortisol got stored as fat. So movement is how we unwind that cortisol that has that extra cortisol that's been stored in our fat stores throughout our body, but specifically the belly area. Okay, last two things, strength training. Again, we wanna build muscle up so that we can have a faster metabolism and so that we're more efficient at, at managing glucose and insulin. There's a thousand different reasons to build muscle, um, but definitely enhancing uh, your fat burning capabilities and minimizing the amount of fat on your belly, really important to be strength training. And then the last one, because cortisol, the belly is all cortisol, having some mindfulness tools, meditation, breath work, taking time to just 
relax, uh, say no to, to stressful situations, all of this is gonna play out on your cortisol levels. When cortisol goes up, the belly goes out. So you, when you bring cortisol down, you start to see that you will accumulate less adipose tissue on your abdomen. Nine things. You follow these nine. So many of you guys have given me feedback over the years that you follow the steps that I have given you when I give you these checklists and you're seeing great results. So here's your belly fat checklist. Let me know if you've done some of these things and you've gotten good results, put it in the comments. Those of you who have lost weight with fasting, put it in the comments. I'd love your fasting wins. And as always, please do not give up on yourself. If you're living in a body that you do not love, it's not your fault. Most likely it's because you haven't been taught things like this on how to take amazing care of this human body you get to live in. So as always, there you go. That's how you get rid of belly fat. And I hope that helps. Dr. Mindy here. And on this video, we're going to talk about sleep and your fat burning hormone. And I may throw a little bit of fasting into it as well, because that's what my channel stands for teaching you all the principles of fasting. Okay. Sleep. Oh my gosh, if there was any question that I get over and over and over again on my YouTube lives, in my Reset Academy, with my clients, it's how do I get a better night's sleep? So we're going to dive into that. And this is the initial video. There's a lot I have to say on sleep and on sleep and fasting. So take this as the, as the first part of many different conversations on sleep that I want to have with you guys. But what I want you to, to realize is that if you are lacking sleep, there's a good chance it's contributing to what we call leptin resistance. If this idea of leptin resistance is brand new to you, I've done a couple other videos this week on it, so go watch those videos. Leptin is your fat burning hormone. It lives in the fat, goes up to the brain, and tells the brain to burn fat for energy. And there are three things you need to think about when it comes to your sleep so that you can make this system work a lot better and kick yourself out of leptin resistance. Okay, the first one, and this is kind of like, I know you're gonna be the dreaded one. You're gonna be like, I know, I know, I'm supposed to sleep more. But I wanna explain the nuances of what we're seeing in the research. So the number one thing you've gotta look at is the amount of sleep. So what they have found is that it typically takes, if for a person to stay healthy and free from leptin resistance, is usually about seven to nine hours a night. The study that is showing where leptin starts to go up, that you get more leptin, is when you're consistently getting five hours of sleep or less. So my first recommendation to you on sleep is make sure you're getting more than five hours and you wanna be closer to that seven hour mark if possible. Now, there's if you're thinking, well, gosh, I can't get more than five hours, you struggle to sleep, maybe you, you sleep, you have a night shift that, you, that you've been doing, you have young kids, there's a couple of caveats to this that are really intriguing. The second thing is that when you get up in the morning, they are finding that as soon as your eyes register light, it starts your circadian rhythm. Now, what's interesting is you don't have to like have your eyes open to see the light. You can just have your eyes closed. And if the light is coming in from your, uh, from your windows, your brain starts to register that it's daytime and it'll start to set your circadian clock. What they've noticed in the setting of the circadian clock early in the morning is that specifically you are getting more red light. So we have the most amount of red light in the morning at sunrise. We have the most amount of red light at night. And it is this red light that will start to bring down your leptin levels. How cool is that? So the study went on to say that if you only got five hours of sleep, but you woke up 
to light and you registered red light early in the morning, that you would still bring your leptin levels down, that the amount of sleep didn't matter as much as long as you were registering this red light early in the morning, because it is that light that sets your circadian clock. How cool is that? So what do you need to do to register that red light? Well, a couple things I'll tell you that I've been doing is getting up with before the sun rises and making sure I have a what I call my thinking chair where I get up and I do my morning ritual, I do my meditation and my fill my mind up with positive thoughts before the day begins. And I make sure it's near the, the, the window so I'm registering the light coming in. My brain is registering that the day is starting. There also are some really interesting alarm clocks that will actually, in your room, start to turn on the light. So even as you're like, you know, your eyes are closed, if that alarm clock is the light starting to fill the room, that's starting your circadian clock, bringing that leptin level down. And then as many of you know, we love the biohack of the Juve light. So that's our personal, there's a lot of great red lights out there. We personally use the Juve light. So if you have like a Juve Mini or a Juve Go, you can just put that right next to your morning chair and make sure that you're getting red light early on. And that will reset your circadian clock. It'll make it easier for you to go to bed at the end of the day. And it will also bring your leptin levels down. How cool is that? Okay. Third thing that I want to tell you on sleep is that there is some interesting research, and I just learned this from Dr. Andrew Huberman. He's a neuroscientist out of Stanford University. He teaches at Stanford Medical School. And if you don't follow him on Instagram, go follow him. He's got a podcast called Huberman Lab. Highly recommend it. But he brought to our attention a study that is showing that the most important part of sleep is not the amount, it's not the light that I just talked about. It's not necessarily the depth of your deep sleep or your REM sleep, but it's your consistency of sleep. Now, his study wasn't done on leptin. It was done on brain performance and learning. And it's such a powerful concept. I wanted to bring it to you guys. He goes on to talk about is that if you go and get 10 hours of sleep one night and the next night you get seven hours and then you get five and then you get eight, that inconsistency of sleep is more damaging to the neurons of the brain than if you're getting five hours consistently over and over and over and over again. So let's put these three principles together. If you know that you don't get a lot of sleep, couple things you're gonna wanna do. You wanna make sure you're waking up to light. You might even wake up to red light. And you wanna make sure you're going to bed at the same time and that you're getting up at the same time. Those two pieces seem to have more of an influence on our uh, what our brain does when we sleep and seems to have more of an influence on our leptin levels than anything else in, in related to sleep. Pretty cool, right? We're just learning so many new little hacks. But what I really want you to take away from this video, because I know so many of you guys are trying to lose weight, is that it can happen sometimes, we see it in our resetter community, where you are doing the right things over and over and over again, but you're still not getting the result. And if you're not getting the result, we've got to look at these hacks like sleep. How do we get you to sleep better? Let's look at the science so that we can make sure that your sleeping patterns are in alignment with the science. There is nothing more frustrating than doing the right thing and not getting the right result. So sometimes you gotta dive into these little tweaks and you will find that you'll have a much deeper experience with all of your fasts. So that's sleep. There you go, let me know. Those of you who are getting great sleep and you've seen great results with your weight loss, please put it in, our, in the comments so the community knows. If you want more information on all those, uh, those research studies that I just pointed out to you, they'll be in the notes. And this whole week is Fast Training Week, so I am bringing you the tools. Each one of these videos is lining up with the next one. My hope is at the end of this week, we have five solid videos that you will know how to kick yourself out of leptin resistance. But we cannot have a conversation about rep leptin resistance without looking at sleep and what the science is saying on sleep.
Dr. Mindy here, and on this video, I am calling all my menopausal women to listen up. If you are struggling losing weight through the menopause experience and beyond, those are this is postmenopausal women. I hear you. I know you're lo you're struggling with getting those extra weight off. This video is for you. Okay, here's I'm going to keep it really simple. Here's the first thing to know: when you go through menopause, as estrogen declines, you become more insulin resistant. So it's that downward spiral of estrogen that causes insulin resistance, which is why your old diet that you did at 35 and 25 stops working. Your old tricks stop working. You had estrogen at 35, you had estrogen at 25, you don't have that same estrogen level at 45, 55, 65. So we've got to change your lifestyle, especially around insulin and make you insulin sensitive again. So that's the first thing. Second thing, it's kind of the sucky part of menopause is that we get a toxic dump. So when we get a toxic dump, when our hormones after 40 go up and down, all those toxins that have been stored in our tissues, stored in our bones, all the heavy metals, the lead, the mercury, the thallium, thallium's what causes the hair to fall out, um, all of the aluminum, those come out of our tissues and they go up into our brain and they start to affect our moods, right? They start to affect how we think, and then the body, because it's so brilliant, what it does is it stores these new toxins that have been released into your bloodstream as fat. So when we look at unwinding the menopausal weight, we've got to look at making you insulin sensitive and then look at detox. And here's how this looks. Let's start with the quick fix. The absolute quick fix right now, today, is to start to apply the principles of the ketogenic diet. I want you to go into the lower carb, I want, ideally for a menopausal woman who's like trying to lose weight, keeping your carbs around 50 grams net carbs is a great place to start and make sure that your, car, that your carbs are coming from nature's carbs. So we want them to come from Think carbs that come out of the earth, not carbs that come out of, of, of a food facility. So the processed carbs, even if they're low calorie, if they're low fat, you might have been doing that for years, those are the things that are causing you to be insulin resistant right now. So the quick fix is bring the carbs down and make sure that they're coming from nature's carbs. Okay, the second quick fix is fasting. So I teach fasting variation here. I teach six different levels of fasting, everything from 13 hours to 72 hours. Go watch the videos I've done on the six variations of fasting. But fasting for menopausal, postmenopausal women, it is like, it's like the golden ticket. So if you haven't tried fasting and you're in your menopausal years, now's the time. So go back to learning how to build a fasting lifestyle. Okay, now let's talk about long-term. What do you do long-term? So the short-term is fasting and low-carb ketogenic style eating. The long-term I put in the menopause reset. So this book, you can get it on Amazon right now. What was really interesting is you all asked me for this to write this book, so I wrote it and so many of you benefited from it. Thank you if you've read it and enjoyed it. Appreciate you. Um, and and tell, put it in the comments below because we are a community here. But here's what I did in this book, is I put five lifestyle changes that every woman after 40 should do. And I'm gonna run through those five right now. I already gave you one. You should start fasting. Second, you should learn how to vary and cycle your food choices. So I go into detail in this book, I go into even more detail and fast like a girl. Third, you gotta think about your microbiome. So if you've been on antibiotics, you've been on birth control a lot during your life, when you go into menopause, you have a whole set of bacteria called the estrobilome that breaks estrogen down. So if that's destroyed, you might be making the age appropriate estrogen, but you're not breaking it down. So we've gotta go back and feed our, our estrobilome. I talk about how to do that in this book. Fourth principle, 
The toxins you're putting on your face, the toxins you're putting on your body, your beauty products, the toxins in your house, the toxins stored in your body, those are causing you to gain weight. Time to detoxify. Absolute. Now, as you go through menopause or you're in postmenopausal years, detox becomes more important than any other time in your life. And then the fifth one is what uh, Libby Weaver calls, Dr. Libby Weaver calls the rushing woman syndrome. I didn't label that, but I sure resonate with it. We've got to start to look at our stress loads. And I'll give you one other bonus one I've been thinking a lot about that isn't in the book, which is working on your, bringing your circadian rhythm back. So make sure that you're out in the sun, that you're seeing the sunlight midday, you're getting up and seeing a sunrise and sunset because these blue lights that are showing up and that we're in all day long will also throw off your hormones and you become more vulnerable to those during menopause. Now, here's what's really interesting. What do you do if you're listening to this and you're 60 years old and you're like, okay, well, I did all that wrong. Well, this is why uh, these principles are so important for women is that it's not too late to go back and change your lifestyle. When you put the five principles that I put in this book into action, even at 65, you regulate estrogen, you regulate progesterone and testosterone, you bring balance back to your hormones. So it's not too late to start to drop weight. We've just gotta go back and redo your lifestyle. And that is, would be my absolute number one recommendation. Now, if you are 40 and you're like, okay, I don't, I don't want that weight gain help now, Put these into action right now. I feel like this is the book that every 40 year old woman should be handed so that she understands what's coming down the pipeline for her with her hormones. And I made it short and easy to read and simple to apply. So if you're 40, make sure you still have a cycle or you're perimenopausal and your cycle's like 60, 90 days apart, make sure that you're applying these five principles. Okay. I have sat with so many women over 40 that are struggling to lose weight. Ah, like I feel you all. And I wanna to explain to you why that happens. Uh, I'm a 52 year old woman. I can tell you that I was in the best shape of my life at 40. By the time I hit 43, I was packing on weight. I wasn't sleeping and uh, my mental clarity uh, and, and just overall energy levels were starting to plummet. And it was because at 40, we have to start to make some dramatic changes in our lifestyle to match the declining estrogen. So check this out. And I really want you to see this because I, I listen to so many of you that beat yourself up and you don't understand at 48, at 68, why you gained weight through the menopausal experience. And it really boils down to one hormone and that's estrogen. Over your life, you get less and less estrogen. Estrogen makes you insulin sensitive. So as estrogen goes down, you become insulin resistant. So what we want to do is find ways to maximize estrogen production. We don't want to tank estrogen production even more. Now, the beautiful thing is as you learn how to fast and you move through menopause and you get over into the late 50s and 60s, what we typically see is if you go through menopause and grace, that when you get to postmenopause, you actually don't have those lingering symptoms that a lot of women do have as they have gone through their 40s with not really minding this key hormone. So let me show you what estrogen really wants you to do after 40. So the first thing is I want you to understand that the major problem after 40 is that you are more insulin resistant, you're gonna gain weight more easily. I know it's not fun, but it's part of the deal. Unless we do some, I'm going to show you the solution here. Uh, your mental clarity might be a little bit off. And this one really fascinates me. And I've talked a lot to several hormone experts on the Resetter podcast, my, my podcast, um, about how it takes our brains as we move through the 40s, it takes our brain time to recalibrate to the loss of estrogen. So we become more reactive to stress. We, we, stress just clicks and kicks in much quicker. 
So we know that this decline of estrogen is not just a weight gain issue, it can be a brain issue as well. So knowing that that's the problem, what's the solution? And this is where intermittent fasting, fasting of all types really comes into play. In the book, I lay out six different levels of fasts for you to engage in and practice with. So once you get the book in your hand, you're gonna be able to practice all these fasts. But here's what, if we want to bring estrogen back, women, if we, we're never getting her back to this point, by the way, we're never going back to her highest point in our mid thirties, maybe even early thirties, it's gonna go down from there. But if we wanna maximize her glory, we've gotta do more fasting and we've got to do more keto. So if you still have a period, I want you to remember, go back to those other videos. If you're in the perimenopausal years and you still have a period, you want to be fasting, intermittent fasting, at least from day one through ovulation day 15. So that's really important. Okay. Now, here's a couple of things I want to point out to women over 40 is that if, what are some of the obstacles that we get when we start to try to lose weight over 40? And here's a couple of things we see. First is that we have to pay attention to progesterone as well. And I, and I wrote about this in the menopause reset. There are moments that we need to make sure that we're not fasting even 13 to 15 hours and we're not going keto. The other thing that I, I really want to point out is that for a lot of us, as we go through our forties, we lose testosterone. And testosterone is our motivating hormone that gets us up to work out. So it's kind of like this weird double-edged sword for women over 40 because we are, as our testosterone goes down, we don't want to work out. But as estrogen goes down, we start gaining more weight. So it's almost like working out isn't our tool for weight loss as we move into, into our 40s. It's actually fasting is our tool. Okay, I gotta interrupt this video because I have a free guide for you so you can master fasting. It's called A Beginner's Guide to a Fasting Lifestyle. And all you've gotta do is click here and you can jump right in. Okay, we're just gonna go right into it. I know when you're menopausal, many times don't have as much focus. So I'm just gonna go right into the meat of what you guys need to know about handling menopause naturally. Here we go. Ready? First thing. At 40, your ovaries start to decline. As they decline, they will have a dramatic effect on three hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Now, you are never getting these hormones back again. So I'm, I apologize. Uh, I have a wonderful chapter in my book that I titled, Dear Progesterone, I'm sorry I took you for granted because that's what I realized is, oh my gosh, I love progesterone, but you're not getting it after 40. So your ovaries start to make this slow decline and what they do is that they hand over the production of these sex hormones to your adrenal glands. Now, if you are a stressed out, rushing woman, you, are, you have been adrenal fatigue for years and years and years, this is gonna be a huge problem for you as you go through menopause. So we'll talk about what you can do, but I want you to realize that there is this handoff that's happening and the adrenals are now in charge. By the time you get into that late 40s, early 50s, your adrenals are running the sex hormone show. Okay, second thing I want you to realize is that this a decline in estrogen means an increase in insulin resistance. So these five things I'm gonna tell you become so relevant in once you get over 40 as that estrogen goes down. The habits you used to be able to do at 35 to keep your weight where you wanted it to be don't work so well at 45 and they definitely don't work well at 55. This is why fasting works so well. There needs to be a change in your lifestyle so we can match that decline in estrogen and not get you insulin resistant. So I'll talk about that in a moment. The third thing I wanna tell you before I go into the lifestyle changes is if you are adrenal fatigued, now is the moment that you need to support your adrenals. And there's a lot of great ways to do that. So if you're working with a holistic practitioner, lean into some adrenal support, but your adrenals are good. If they're not great, then your progesterone levels will be low. 
if your progesterone levels are low, you're not gonna sleep well, your happiness will be down, and you're gonna have trouble calming your body. If your adrenals are fatigued, testosterone is gonna be low, that's your motivation, your libido, your ability to build muscle. So, you know, from one organ not doing well can have a huge hormonal consequence for you. So make sure you're supporting your adrenals. Okay, five changes you need to make. Are you ready? And I wrote about them in the Menopause Reset. So this book is meant to be one that you could just devour in 48 hours and you can put into action. Here are the five things. Okay, first, you got to stop eating all day. We've got to lean into a fasting lifestyle. If you're here on my channel, my guess is you're already trying to figure out how to do that. In the book, I give you steps to go from zero to being able to fast like a crazy woman, and I mean that with a positive crazy. In the book, I'm gonna show you those steps. Second thing that you need to do, you need to know how to vary your food. Now, this one is tough, I get it, but I want to teach you how to lean into more keto variations. And there are a lot of different styles of keto. There's low keto where you bring your car carbs way down. There is keto biotic where you keep your carbs a little higher. Carnivore is a form of keto. There's keto vegetarian. I talk about it all in the book, but I, if you haven't tried keto, now's the time to try keto because it will really help you become more insulin sensitive again. But as you guys hopefully know, you also need to have some hormone building feast days where you're leaning into foods that raise progesterone. So knowing when to do keto and throwing keto in, mixing that with some fasts, and then throwing in some hormone feasting days, that is the key to being able to manage almost any menopause symptom. So again, if you're like, what is she talking about? It's in the book or it's in the survival guide. We got all everything I could think of to help you through menopause. We put in here and we put in the survival guide. So it's there for you, okay? Just put survival guide in the notes and, and you'll get the free copy. Okay, third thing, your microbiome. Go back and watch the video that I did on hot flashes. Your microbiome matters, and especially as you move through menopause. So lean into more leafy green vegetables, more vegetables in general. I can't tell you how many uh, of our resetters really struggle with their menopause symptoms, and all they do is add in some vegetables, and now they're breaking down the little bit of estrogen they have, they're breaking it down really efficiently, and the symptoms start to go away. So you're fasting, you're leaning into keto variations, you're feeding your microbiome. The fourth step is that I want you to think about your toxic load. The things you're putting on your skin, what you're putting on your hair, your household cleaners, um, if you're living in a moldy home, the lead in your water, um, the amalgam fillings in your mouth, all of this starts to catch up to you when you go through menopause. So first step is look around at your toxic load and can you bring your toxic load down and start to learn some how learn how to detox. Detox becomes more important at menopause than any other time of your life. And then the fifth one, and this is the one I'm still working on. I will tell you that I have not perfected this one. The other four I've done really well on, but this one's hard. And it's called Stop the Rushing Woman Syndrome. That is a term that was coined by Dr. Libby Weaver. And in her book, she talks about how our physiology was not meant to go, go, go all the time. So once you move into menopause, you're gonna to have to be more sensitive to say no to things. You're gonna to have to build in some recovery days. You gotta slow things down. You can't stay at that same pace, otherwise those sex hormones will be tanked. Get out into nature, get out at sunset. I love for menopausal women to walk at sunset because it starts to register that the day is ending, you'll get more melatonin, you'll sleep better. So there's a lot, again, really cool hacks like that on the menopausal survival guide. So if you want a copy of that, just put it in the comments. So those are the five things. And guys, I, I have been over the last six weeks, I've been on podcasts, I have been interacting with our academy, I've been listening to you guys, and I, I watch the comments. People always put, hey, this stuff works. And I kind of laugh to myself, because I'm like, yep, it does work, it works. I, not, I didn't just test it on me, we have rolled out these five things over hundreds of thousands of menopausal women worldwide, and they work. 
I know you're struggling to lose weight. It may be your fasting length. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the perfect fasting length to unstick weight loss. In fact, it's such an incredible tool for weight loss. I think you should start with fasting before you change your food to be able to get into that door in for losing weight.